Part Four, Chapter Forty Six: Jakes and the Lady. I was sold to a corn dealer and baker whom Jerry knew, and with him he thought I should have a good food and fair work. In the first, he was quite right, and if my master had always been on the premises, I do not think I should have been overloaded. But there was a foreman who was always hurrying and driving everyone, and frequently, when I had quite a full load, he would order something else to be taken on. My carter, whose name was Jake's, often said it was more than I ought to take, but the other always overruled him. Twas no use going twice when once would do, and he chose to get business forward. Jake's, like the other carters, always had the bearing rein up, which prevented me from drawing easily, and by the time I had been there three or four months, I found the work telling very much on my strength. One day I was loaded more than usual, and part of the road was a steep uphill. I used all my strength, but I could not get on and was obliged continually to stop. This did not please my driver, and he laid his whip on badly. Get on, you lazy fellow, he said, or I'll make you. And again, I started the heavy load and struggled on a few yards. Again, the whip came down, and again, I struggled forward. The pain of the great cart whip was sharp, but my mind was hurt quite as much as my poor sides. To be punished and abused when I was doing my very best was so hard. I took the heart out of me. A third time, he was flogging me cruelly when a lady stepped quickly up to him and said in a sweet, earnest voice, Oh, pray, do not whip your good horse any more. I am sure he is doing all he can, and the road is very steep. I am sure he is doing his best. If doing his best won't get this load up, he must do something more than his best. That's all I know, ma'am, said Jakes. But is it not a very heavy load, she said. Yes. Yes, too heavy, he said, but that's not my fault. The foreman came just as we were starting and would have 300 weight more put on to save him trouble, and I must get on with it as well as I can. He was raising the whip again when the lady said, pray stop, I think I can help you if you will let me. The man laughed. You see, she said, you do not give him a fair chance. He cannot use all his power with his head held back as it is with the bearing ring. If you would take it off, I am sure he would do better. Do try it, she said persuasively. I should be very glad if you would. Well, well, said Jakes with a short laugh. Anything to please a lady, of course. How far would you wish it down, ma'am? Quite down. Give him his head altogether. The rain was taken off, and in a moment I put my head down to my knees. What a comfort it was. Then I tossed it up and down several times to get the aching sniffness out of my neck. Poor fellow, that is what you wanted, said she, patting and stroking me with her gentle hand. And now if you will speak kindly to him and lead him on, I believe he'll be able to do better. Jakes took the rein. Come on, Blackie. I put down my head and threw my whole weight against the collar. I spared no strength. The load moved on and I pulled it steadily up the hill and then stopped to take breath. The lady had walked along the footpath and now came across it into the road. She stroked and patted my neck as I had not been patted for many a long day. You see, he was quite willing when you gave him the chance. I am sure he is a fine-tempered creature, and I dare say he has known better days. You won't put that rein on again, will you? For he was just going to hitch it up on the old plan. Well, ma'am, I can't deny that having his head has helped him up a hill, and I'll remember it another time, and thank you, ma'am. But if he went out without a bearing rein, I should be the laughing stock of all the carters. It is the fashion, you see. Is it not better, she said, to lead a good fashion than to follow a bad one? A great many gentlemen do not use bearing reins now. Our carriage horses have not worn them for 15 years and work with much less fatigue than those who have them. Besides, she added in a very serious voice, we have no right to distress any of God's creatures without a very good reason. We call them dumb animals, and so they are, for they cannot tell us how they feel, but they do not suffer less because they have no words. But I must not detain you now. I thank you for trying my plan with your good horse, and I am sure you will find it far better than the whip. Good day. And with another soft pat on my neck, she stepped lightly across to the path, and I saw her no more. That was a real lady. I'll be bound for it, said Jakes to himself. She spoke just as polite as if I was a gentleman, and I'll try her plan. 
uphill at any rate. And I must do him the justice to say that he lit my rein out several holes and going uphill after that, he always gave me my head, but the heavy loads went on. Good feed and fair rest will keep up one's strength under full work, but no horse can stand against overloading. And I was getting so thoroughly pulled down from this cause that a younger horse was brought in my place. I may as well mention here what I suffered at this time from another cause. I had heard horses speak of it, but had never myself had experience of the evil. This was a badly lighted stable. There was only one very small window at the end, and the consequence was that the stalls were almost dark. Besides the depressing effect this had on my spirits, it very much weakened my sight, and when I was suddenly brought out of the darkness into the glare of daylight, it was very painful to my eyes. Several times I stumbled over the threshold and could scarcely see where I was going. I believe had I stayed there very long, I should have become pure blind, and that would have been a great misfortune. For I have heard men say that a stone blind horse was safer to drive than one which had imperfect sight, as it generally makes them very timid. However, I escaped without any permanent injury to my sight and was sold to a large cab owner. <laughs>